So how can you develop for mixed reality or virtual reality with just less than $100 today? And yes, you heard me right. But you may be thinking, is this real? How can it be so low compared to what's available in the market today, right? Well, it is real and you can do this by using a device called Sapbox, which essentially turns your mobile device into a mixed reality headset. And to prove that theory, we're going to be building a pretty cool game from the ground up today that will work with Sapbox as well as other devices with WebXR support. But first, let's take a look at what's included with this device. The box comes with two Bluetooth 60OF controllers, which means that we're going to be able to track the position of the controllers as well as the rotations. And this is all by using markers. The box also includes a lightweight headset accessory for your mobile device, which provides a field of view of 100 degrees. The headset piece comes with the building strap, which is adjustable and also an area that is going to allow you to basically place your iPhone. But wait, did you just say iPhone? And yes, these devices of today only supports iPhones with iOS 11 or greater. However, I talked to Sapor and they told me that they were working on Android support. So just keep that in mind before ordering this device. So next we have the world anchors. And these are markers that allow your mobile device to track virtual content with six degrees of freedom. And yes, this is very similar to the way that the controllers work, where we have markers that we can see through the field of view, and then the application is able to track the position and also rotations. So how easy is it to set up that sub box, right? Well, it is super easy, which is why I have enjoyed using this device for development over the last few months. The first thing that we'll do to set it up is make sure that both controllers are loaded with batteries. Then we're going to be powering them on. Make sure that you enable Bluetooth on your mobile device and then place the controllers on a flat surface next to you. We're also going to be making sure that we place the world markers in front of us and then keep them somewhat close to each other. I normally place them about one to two feet away from each other and I'm able to get very good tracking results. Lastly, we'll start by downloading a few experiences available in the App Store for Sapbox, as well as looking at a demo that we're going to be building today. So I wanna show you the final look of this demo so you know exactly what you're gonna be building. So here's a look at the Sapbox prototype that we're going to be building today. The idea came to mind while getting inspired by playing Puzzle in Places, which is a really cool puzzle game available on multiple XR platforms. Building this type of experience will also help you in understanding how to build games or apps with Mattercraft and that work with WebXR. Next up, we have a Sapbox application called 3D Models that is available from the App Store. This app is great because it enables you to see exactly how 3D models look in your physical environment. Personally, I'm a fan of space, so I ended up taking a look at how the rover looks like by placing it right on a table that is tracked by using the Sapbox world markers. You can also scale, rotate, move the 3D models, and even play the 3D model animations by using a menu activated through the Sapbox controllers. If you notice, there's also a really cool feature that allows you to view shadows reflected onto real world surfaces from the 3D models themselves, as well as from the controllers which I think it gives it a really cool realistic look. The next model showcases an arcade machine which provides you with Pac-Man animations which actually look really cool. And lastly, we have a very realistic robot arm which I selected to get a sense of what it would be like to use Sapbox with robotics in case there were people here working within those type of use cases. So now if you want to build an experience from scratch by using, you know, for your Sapbox, I recommend looking into Mattercraft, which is what we're gonna be doing today. So I'm gonna go ahead and give my project a name and then just click on Open Mattercraft and then we're gonna be selecting VR and MR pass-through template. Once you open the template, you're gonna be able to see left controller, right controller. You can also change the visualization. This is not going to affect what renders when you run this on the sub box. It's going to detect that automatically. You can also look at the immersion settings, whether it's gonna be AR or VR. And then we're also going to be downloading physics components in this case for grabbing some of the objects. Next, let's add two meshes, one for the puzzle desk and one simple red box to test grab interactions with physics. We can add physics components. In this case, we can add a rigid body, make sure that you make it grabbable. Also, I'm going to be changing here the bounciness so we can make it more, you know, can make it bounce when we hit play, it's gonna go through because we haven't really added physics components to our puzzle desk. 
So just make sure that you do that as well. In this case, it's gonna be kinematic because we don't want the desk to be grabbable or to fall with gravity. So we can just make it kinematic. And then if you hit play, you can see that now the cube is going to collide with it. Then on the left and right controller, we need to add a component called the rigid body grabber. And this is what's going to allow you to grab any objects that we designate to be, you know, grabbable. So we're gonna need to do that with the left controller and also the right controller. And just make sure that you change the radius. I did 0.1 on the radius. And then the other setting that you need to set is going to be the grab at current distance. That way we can grab them, you know, when colliding with the objects. And then next we need to add a couple of different states. So the set grab state is going to tell the system that we are grabbing an object. So just make sure that you add that component also associate it with the correct grabber. And then we're going to need to add the toggle grab state. So just go ahead and associate it to on select N and then associate the grabber so that we can tell the object when we're no longer grabbing it. And then you're also going to need to do that with the right controller so we can just repeat that. So that should be good to go. Let's go ahead and publish it. And then it's going to create a new version and I can show you here the results. To get this going, we're going to be basically scanning the barcode and then we can start the application. It's gonna tell you that you need to turn on the controllers. Once it's ready to go and it has been connected via Bluetooth, we should be able to launch it. There's one issue with the experience based on the offset that I said, I think the height is not correct. So let's go ahead and get back to Mothercraft and fix that. So I'm gonna go ahead and change the puzzle desk pivot position to be zero and then also the cube we can just offset it a little bit. So that is right above the desk. So now you can see that it is at the pivot position. So this is something that I wanted to show you so that you know where the position of your virtual object is going to be in relation to the trackers. Okay, for the next part, we're going to be removing the box and then we're gonna be creating a couple of folders for models, textures, audio, and also scripts. Then let's go ahead and extract the video underscore resources. The link is going to be below. You can download it from GitHub and then just follow the steps to to basically drag and drop all of the resources into the appropriate folders. We're gonna have a model here for the moon. It's gonna be more of decoration because I wanna have that animating in the background. I also want to add these for basically the corners of the frame. And I'm gonna show you what that is, basically where the puzzle pieces are going to be located. Also, I have a couple of different sounds in here that we're gonna have, one for the background music, one for different selections. So when we select an object, and also one that we're gonna be using when we are placing the objects in the right position. And lastly, this one is going to be for the UI. Then let's go ahead and drag and drop the puzzle underscore one. It's gonna have all the different pieces for the puzzle that we're going to have as a starting point. So you guys can see here, there's gonna be the full version of the puzzle that we're building. And then the other pieces are going to be all the individual fractures that I made by using Blender. I also have a puzzle two and a puzzle three that you guys can incorporate as well. For this tutorial, we're just gonna do one. Then what we need to do now is we need to create a new group. And this group is going to be basically for the environment assets. I'm gonna go ahead and drag and drop the moon here. And then we can also just reposition this. Let's go ahead and rename it to be the underscore moon. The source name should be correct. That's the file name. And then we can just go ahead and offset it a little bit. I'm gonna put it towards the back and then that way it's not right in front of us when we're running the experience. And then the next thing that I wanna do though is I wanna add an animation for the moon. Basically it's going to be rotating as we play the experience so we can add a new layer here. And then we can also add a timeline and I'm gonna call it a space. So if you select the space, make sure that you set it to loop and also to basically play on a star. Now what we can do though is we can start creating keyframes. So I'm gonna create a keyframe for the rotation. We can set it to be 0, 0, 0 because it's not going to have any rotation at the beginning. And then I'm gonna have these to be about two minutes. So just set it to 120,000 milliseconds. And then we can go here to the very end and then set the last breakpoint to be 360 degrees. That way it's going to be rotating completely as it plays this animation and then it's going to loop back through once it finishes. And then the next thing that I'm gonna do though is I'm gonna create a new component and it's gonna be of type audio. Let's go ahead and rename it to be background music. Then we can go ahead and associate the right audio track. I'm gonna be using the one that I'm showing you right now and then set it to autoplay. And then the volume, we can set it to be something about 70% and then just make sure that it is set to loop. Now we can create a new group and this group is going to be for the frame 
Basically think of the frame, the area that we're gonna be placing the puzzle pieces on. So I'm gonna create it here really quickly so that I can show you. The edges are going to be the corners and then the transparent area is going to be where we're gonna be placing the puzzles. And then if you go into the group and then create a new group, this is gonna be a group for the puzzle pieces themselves. That way we can place them all in here and then I can keep track of all these different positions and rotations based on this relative position of this group. So I'm going to go ahead and set this to 0.3. So it's going to be the pivot point of all the objects that are going to be childs of the puzzles group. And then let's go ahead and drag and drop the puzzle underscore one cell zero zero GLB. This is going to be the first puzzle piece. And then we can go ahead and scale it. So you can also rename it or you can leave it as it is. It doesn't really matter. But in my case, I'm going to rename it. And then this is going to be one of the pieces that we'll have. But before we can start interacting with it, we need to add a component and it's going to be a rigid body. Then just make sure you make it grabbable. And also the damping is going to be pretty, pretty high. And then make sure that it is dynamic because we're going to be moving this around. And then to be able to detect collisions, we need to add a collider as well. So I'm going to do that as well. In, in this case, I'm going to add box colliders because I want these to basically have good performance. I found that using box colliders for this experience worked better. And then let's go ahead and add a rigid event emitter. The reason for this is because I wanted to play a sound. You don't really need to do this, but this is going to play a sound when I'm grabbing an object and I can do also another behavior which is going to play a sound when I'm releasing the object, I think it just adds more to the experience so you can bind this to the on release and then just change the volume as well. And this is the results of doing that. You can grab the pieces. I can, you know, I can move them around. And then in this case, we don't have the logic to basically detect when you win, but this is a starting point of what we need to build. And then let's just go ahead and create a new puzzle pieces behavior. So just right click on the scripts and then just give it that name. Once you're ready to go, we can go ahead and add it to the puzzles group. So just make sure that you add that component. That way the logic applies correctly. So now we can see here that the behavior has three different options and then all the pieces are correctly stacked together. So now we need to do a new behavior that is going to allow us to basically make these more random. So this shuffle array function is going to allow us to do that. Then now we can go ahead and change the puzzle number here and you're gonna see how the pieces are all randomized as I'm changing the observable property behind the scenes. And basically when that change happens, then we're going to be able to regenerate and then basically rearrange all the pieces. And then you can see here, if I change the value of X and make it bigger, then everything it's going to look more separated from each other. But that's not what I want to do though. I want to make sure that I don't do that manually. We do that through a button. So we're going to be basically using this play button to execute that randomization. It's going to call into the puzzle pieces and then they're going to be randomized. So this menu behavior, it's going to allow you to do that. You can basically listen to the play button and click. And then when that happens, we're going to be calling into our puzzle pieces and then the initialized target position is going to get called. Okay, so what I'm going to do next though is we're going to be creating a new, basically a game state text. And this is going to allow us to tell the user if they have completed the puzzle. So we're going to be using this text for that. Also, if we haven't found a solution, maybe we grab a piece and it wasn't in the right location, then we're also going to be displaying that information by using this game state text. I'm going to be making a couple of changes here to the puzzle pieces. I also need to create a new observable, which is gonna be the proximity threshold. That one is not going to do anything just yet, but we're gonna have that to determine when the pieces are close to their target destination. So we need to also clone the play button. So I'm gonna be doing this because we're gonna to have to save the pieces, basically their locations that we need to check for to determine if somebody solved the puzzle or not. So this one, I'm just gonna call it output and we can just say behind the scenes, it's gonna be 
are putting the pieces transforms and the transform is going to be the position and also the rotation so for now just think of this as a debugging tool for what we're going to be building so let's go ahead and create a new typescript file and this will be called puzzle interfaces the main reason that we need to do this is because we're going to be using these types to save the target pieces data to memory this function will then output the puzzle pieces initial position since we're going to have the puzzle solve to record this information. So let's go ahead and place all the target pieces at their target locations, or at least approximately where they need to be. So once you're ready to go, we can go ahead and hit the button and you're gonna see that this generated JSON data because in the code, I have an output, a console log that is outputting the data into JSON. So the cool thing with this though, is we can grab this information and then this information is gonna be helpful to calculate the distance from the current grab puzzle piece versus the target position, as well as the rotation. In my case, I'm not going to be checking for rotations, at least not in this version, but we're gonna be using the positions to determine how close we are from the destination, which is what I'm gonna be adding right now. I'm gonna be adding all the target positions and also the rotations. And then once we have this, we can implement the in close to target, which is going to determine if we're close to the target destination or not. If we are, then we know that we solved the puzzle. You guys can see here that I can randomize the pieces. We can also start grabbing the pieces and make sure that we place them in the right locations. And then as soon as we place them in the right locations, we should be hearing a sound. And also once we place all of them in the right locations, then we should be able to see the message that states that we solved the puzzle, which you can see here, at least one piece is now closed. And then now we can see all pieces are close to their targets. This is the final version. If you guys want to check it out, I'm going to be putting this in GitHub. Also the link for you guys to try it out. This has three different puzzles and also a couple of debug options, which I think are going to be helpful whenever you're building new puzzles. Well, I hope you enjoy watching my full walkthrough of Sapbox and Mothercraft. I believe this device is a great choice for those people who like to get into mixed reality, either as a developer or as a non-dev and without having to break the bank, right? And if you have an iPhone, then all you're looking at spending is less than $100. I do wish the market tracking was better as I kept losing tracking capabilities during low light conditions. And honestly, relying on markers may not be as reliable for some use cases. However, I don't believe I will use this device for super complicated projects, but more for fun to learn mixed reality or virtual reality development. Well, thanks everyone for watching. If you guys have any questions, let me know in the comments below. Also a huge thanks to all my patrons for supporting my content and happy XR coding everyone.